All right, you crazy kids. Here's your lecture on heating curves and intermolecular forces. So this is what a generic heating curve looks like. All right, there's no big craziness to it. In reality, it should be kind of curved like this, hence heating curve. But we have this nice angled one to make it a little bit easier for us. And in all these examples, I'm imagining something starting this down here, and then I'm going to be heating it up over time, and this is how it changes. So this is like the path it would actually follow. So it's not a linear change, hence it's a curve, or as you heat something, it curves its uh, data, I guess you could say. Yeah, cool. All right, good talking. Here we go. So states of matter. In any heating curve, you're going to start with a solid, you're going to change to a liquid, and eventually to a gas how it works. Where's the freezing point, the FP? Well, your freezing point is at the first horizontal, so in this case it's about 60 degrees Celsius. And where's the boiling point? Your boiling point's at the second horizontal, or about 90 degrees Celsius. Realize that freezing point is the same as melting point, and boiling point is the same as condensing point. It just depends on what direction you're going. So the freezing point would be from, you know, a liquid to a solid in this direction. A melting point would go in this direction. It just depends on how you're actually viewing your states of matter and whether or not you're adding heat or removing heat. Where is melting and boiling actually occurring? Melting is at this first horizontal. That's why it changes shape. Where is boiling occurring? Well, boiling is at the second horizontal. This part right here. That's how it works. Here's an important part that we have to focus on, though. Exothermic first, endothermic. So endothermic, we've talked about this briefly before. That's when energy is absorbed by the actual compound or whatever you're, you're working with, right, by the reaction itself. So energy, energy is absorbed. From a solid to a liquid to a gas moving in this direction, that is endothermic. We're going to be showing that as a positive value, meaning that energy is absorbed. If I'm working in the opposite direction, if I'm going from, you know, say a gas to a liquid to a solid, energy is actually being released. So that would be a negative value. Energy is released into the system. That's how we view it in chemistry. There's no other way to do it. You're going to have to get used to that. Phase changes. Where am I going to have some phase changes? Where a phase change, by definition, is changing from a solid to a liquid. So here and here. And where am I going to have temperature changes? Well, a temperature change is going to be all the slanty parts. And that's going to be showing that the temperature is actually increasing. Here, here, and here. It's important to note that as the system is changing phase, or as the substance you're working with, there is no change in temperature. All right, so that energy has to be going into something else. And we're going to learn that that energy is going to breaking intermolecular forces, or forces of attraction, between whatever compound you're dealing with. Change in kinetic energy, once again. Changes in kinetic energy happen at these slanty parts. In your brains, you're going to have to match up the idea of kinetic energy and temperature as literally the same thing, because they are. How do you measure kinetic energy? Well, you take something's temperature, and that's how fast it's legit moving. For heat of fusion and heat of vaporization, we're going to be using these in specific parts of our heating curve. Heat of fusion is going to be at your first uh, horizontal. We're going to be talking about things fusing together. That's just how it works. And heat of vaporization is at your second horizontal, HV. What is calorimetry? What's the whole point of all these heating curve things? Well, you're going to be measuring the amount of heat of a chemical or physical change. Well, we're going to be doing this when we talk about thermodynamics, but right now we're going to be doing it with a heating curve. Now, Q equals mc delta t. You've seen that before. Q is the actual energy lost or gained. M is mass. Delta t is the change in temperature. Temperature final minus temperature initial. We're going to be dealing with Celsius here. For this C value, that's the specific heat. The amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of the substance by one degree Celsius. These are the specific heats for water. Notice how there's more than one. So it's dependent upon its state of matter. The solid and gaseous uh, specific heat are slightly different, but I'm just going to make them the same value for your own convenience because these are not in your packet. So you're going to have to memorize them. No other way around it. Heat of fusion and heat of vaporization, those are in your packet. All right, That's only for water, though. So if I give you a substance besides water, I would have to provide that information to you. Now, we might have noticed a couple things here. I have some formulas that I'm going to be using. Depending upon where you are in the heating curve, you have to use a different formula. If we look, this is change in temperature. Q is MC delta T. Where do you have changes in temperature? Oh, here, here, and here. That's how it works. All right. Heat of vaporization and heat of fusion, depending upon where you are, also are going to be in different portions of this heating curve. 
So be wary. When you start to do calculations, you have to use the correct formula depending upon where you are. I'm going to show you an example of that in a heartbeat. Heat versus temperature, just so we're all on the same page. Heat is a transfer of thermal energy between molecules in a system, and temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules in a system. Please, kinetic energy and temperature, link those two in your brain, and we're going to see that all year long. Here's an actual question. All right. Uh, what is the change in energy of a 33-gram sample of water uh, as it's cooled from 77 degrees to 31 degrees? So here we have a heating curve for water. It looks pretty generic, but that's what it is. I know it's water because at my freezing point of zero, my boiling point of 100, I have my horizontals, so it looks pretty accurate. In my brain, what I do is I put a little star right here, and I put a little star right here. That means I'm going from the star on my right to the star on my left. Oh, that means this is going to be a negative value or an exothermic type of change. Energy is going to be released. Now, my first little part here is going from this star, and I run into this line right here, 0 degrees Celsius. So for my Q equals MC delta T here, my change in temperature is only going to be 2 0 degrees Celsius. My next part, I'm going to have Q equals MHF. All right, that's how I'm going to be calculating the amount of energy that it took to actually change phase. And finally, I'm going to be starting at zero and then going all the way down to negative 31 degrees Celsius. That's going to be my Q equals MC delta T part of that. I need to then add these three things together. So in terms of sig figs, I got to do sig figs here, here, and here. And then I'm going to be adding them all together and doing my sig figs at the end that way. We're going to call this part one, part two, and part three because I've already solved it. Here's part one, part two, and part three. That's how that looks. So you can check my math. I don't know, maybe I made a mistake, maybe I didn't. Notice how I am rounding here to two sig figs, here to two sig figs, and here to two sig figs, and then I'm adding those values up and using a different rule for sig figs at the end of the day. I have negative 5,610 calories. That's because this is exothermic. Energy is released. I started at a liquid and I went to a solid. To do that, I have to slow down my individual particles. To slow them down, I have to remove energy. Exothermic, negative amount of energy. That's how it works. You're releasing it into the system. We show a release of energy as a negative value. All right, intermolecular forces. We got three kinds, and that's gonna be the end of this lecture. These are forces of attraction between molecules. Molecules only. Not ionic things, not uh, metallic bonded things, all right? Just molecules. Molecules have covalent bonds. That's how this works. Now, they vary in strength, and they're always weaker than intramolecular forces. An intramolecular force is an ionic, covalent, or metallic bond. These have a very, very strong force of attraction, okay? So these don't have as strong of a force of attraction as those intramolecular. They're just intermolecular. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, hydrogen bonding is your first type of intermolecular force. This is going to be the strongest of the three. All right, so for hydrogen bonding, uh, we will write down strongish. Strongest force of attraction. Force of attraction. Okay. Now, hydrogen bonding is literally the force of attraction between molecules. It would look like this, these little dotted lines. All right. I'm not talking about the bonds. This looks like water, and it actually is water, of H and 2O. All right. I'm talking about the attraction between water, water molecules. That's what I mean by a force of attraction. All right. These are called intermolecular forces, force of attraction between molecules. So what is hydrogen bonding? Well, hydrogen bonding occurs in three cases. If you have a hydrogen fluorine, a hydrogen, whoa, I already wrote the word on one, hydrogen nitrogen, or a hydrogen-oxygen bond. For H2O, I meet that requirement because I have a hydrogen-oxygen bond. There it is, right there, shown here. All right, because I have a hydrogen-oxygen bond, I have hydrogen bonding. If I had NH3, whoa, that's still, whoop, hydrogen bonding, nitrogen and hydrogen, okay? Nothing changes there. If I did that, maybe I would do this, and I would, like, duplicate a bunch of these. Turn them around a little bit. Whoa. Cool. Oh, I made it too small, but whatever. I would still have hydrogen bonding between these molecules because you have a hydrogen bonded to a nitrogen, and that meets the requirement. All right? Forces of attraction between things. It's usually represented by a dotted line, and that's the whole point. 
Dipole-dipole is going to be a force of attraction between two polar molecules. And that should kind of make sense, right? Like, if something's polar and it has a positive and a negative part, all right, I draw on a dipole, all right, we'll make that something just this rectangle. It doesn't matter what molecule it really is. If I have another one of those right next to it, well, I can have another positive and negative. That means I'm going to have two dipoles that are lined up. I'm going to have a force of attraction between the positive and negative parts of polar molecules. That's what's kind of going to hold them together and change their state of matter. That's the whole idea. All right, so for dipole-dipole, it's very similar to hydrogen bonding. However, it's not quite as strong. We're going to put it at the strength as a medium strength, not quite as powerful. All right, so the negative region of one polar molecule is attracted to the positive region of the adjacent molecule. No big deal. Notice how I'm going down in strength. So I went from strongish to medium. London dispersion, or a temporary dipole-dipole, is the weakest of all three. Okay. That weakest can change, but for right now, we're just going to call it the weakest. Now, to explain a London dispersion in a temporary dipole, I've pulled up neon here. So here's neon. It has 10 protons, 10 electrons. That's kind of what it looks like. Neon freezes at negative 247.5 degrees Celsius. It freezes because I would have to have an attraction between my atoms. Now, this is not polar. All right? There's just one atom of neon. It doesn't have a hydrogen-nitrogen bond. It doesn't have anything else. So what's going to make it be attracted to other atoms so that it'll actually join together and solidify? The answer is London dispersion forces. London dispersion states that because electrons are always in motion, it's possible that they could all kind of move to one side of my atom, right? Here's my pretend atom. If they're all on that side, this side of the atom is going to become slightly negative. This side is going to be slightly positive. That means I'm going to be creating a temporary dipole. That temporary dipole is going to induce a nearby atom to do the same thing, meaning a nearby atom would create boop, boop, another force of attraction or another dipole. Well, I can't really move that. I'm, I'm, hopefully you guys get what I'm talking about. All right, so it kind of looks like I have a dipole-dipole. Here's my dipole, here's my dipole. Sorry, it went off screen. So it's very similar to dipole-dipole up here. However, it's only due to the movement of electrons. Because it's due to the movement of electrons, it's weaker than a dipole-dipole force of attraction. All right? Now, what's the whole point with these forces of attraction, intermolecular forces? These actually dictate why things are in the solid, liquid, and gaseous state. The stronger the force of attraction, the more likely it's going to be in the solid or liquid state. The weaker the force of attraction, the more likely it's going to be in the gaseous or liquid state. All right, that's just how it works. A long time ago, I said, well, ew, H2O is in the liquid state. It's in the liquid state, even though it's a covalent bond, because it has hydrogen bonding. That's how it works. However, like O2, well, O2 is a you know nonpolar molecule. It doesn't have any dipoles. There's nothing to it. It's in the gaseous state because all it has is London dispersion. That is your lecture on intermolecular forces and heating curves.